company, yes. People <laughs> aren't allowed to know about this. Yeah. And that's why. Who, who protected uh, this information? Who protected Oliver North? The head Democrat. Which goes to show you the power structure is the same. With respect to Brooks challenging North or asking him about these residual standby plans, which have been in existence for some time, but which are more proximate to us today as a result of a uh, national security advisory that President Reagan signed in May of 1984, and which, of course, is by its very nature uh, under the um, coverage of uh, security. And uh, you could be uh, hauled up and brought in by the FBI and charged with espionage if you were to reveal any knowledge as to the exact content of that document. But there's no question that it was patterned after what was talked about during the Watergate crisis. At that time, uh, there were standby powers. General Haig at that time was the one uh, in which there were such things seriously discussed as the suspension of the national elections in 1974, or, or rather 72, 72. If there were uh, turbulence and uh, disorder throughout the country that would prevent an orderly process, well, who's going to determine that? Once you do that, then it's possible to invoke such things as military. If the American people knew the, how loose this has become, I mean, you always need scenarios for a disaster. Right. And, you know, our government would be ill-serving us if they didn't prepare these scenarios. But when you bring into these scenarios domestic dissent as a, as a provocateur of this, of this being implemented, then we're talking about a, a level of political repression that I don't think Congress would tolerate if the people knew about it. But they don't know about it because, of course, it's a matter of national security that we don't talk about it, therefore we've got to trust them. Well, trust them? I mean, they don't have a very good track record in some of these agencies for trust. Or why would a government be against civil liberties? It's hard to imagine that they would assault, you know, our very constitution, our very basic liberties. This is not just an attack on the constitutional protections of the rights, the emancipated peoples and of the peoples of color. This is an attack on every single constitutional right of every person. The right not to be, have your home broken into, the right not to be stopped on a highway and searched and frisked without a warrant, the violations of the Fourth Amendment, the protections of the First Amendment, the protections of the right to counsel. They have a conscious effort to weaken and undermine every one of these rights. And what is beginning to develop, and people are beginning to see this, the power structure, not only in the government, but in the big corporations, they are very frightened. And what are they frightened at? That millions and millions of people in this country are angry and suffering from the most elementary problems that they have, which are not being solved. One of the most shocking examples, and I'm sure you have some of this down here in Texas. I've been at many meetings all through the Midwest, of whom the family farmers, and hundreds of thousands of family farmers are facing what? The worst crisis in their lives, the farm mortgage foreclosure crisis, Mm -hmm. in which the big banks are coming in and they're open about it. They've decided that we don't need family farms any longer in this country, that we must have what is known as what? Corporate agriculture. Right. And they will be destroyed. All right, the family farmers, and we must understand this, they are not long-haired radicals. Right. They are what, what we've always known as the heart of middle America. And what are they saying? They're in meetings all over. They are furious, and why? Because they want, they went to the White House, they demanded what? What their grandparents got from a certain president known as Franklin Roosevelt. The first thing, and I, I, I was a youngster at that time, I didn't even remember this, but I'll never forget an older farmer saying this to me at a meeting in Kansas, that his father had told him that the first thing that Franklin Roosevelt had done when he was 
elected was to sign a presidential decree declaring a four-year moratorium on farm foreclosures, right. giving the family farmers right. a chance to move forward, and they were saved. All right, they went to Washington during the Reagan period, and then again the first this year of the Bush administration, and you know what they were told by Reagan and Bush? Go home. We don't have any right to interfere with banks. <laughs> we don't have any right, we don't have any power to do this. So the family farmers are furious, and what are they looking for? For the first time, they want to work together with what? Millions of people, and many of them across the state line from them, who are facing what? The crisis of plant closings. Hundreds of thousands, millions of American people. Workers. Working people. And many of them white working people, many of them people of color, are faced with devastation. And I don't have to tell you folks down here. You take a look, you go into anywhere along the Ohio River, for example, where the steel plants were first developed, and you go into some of these cities, and what does it look like? London looked like after the bombings in World War II, because the plants are all closed down, and the business people, the small business people are destroyed, there's no market, and they're furious, and they're trying to come together, and what are they demanding? Very elementary demand. If these companies close our plants, we must have the right to run them ourselves. We must have the right to take them over. And the state of Pennsylvania, as a result of this pressure from the majority of its people, passed a bill setting up a plant closing agency that had the power under, a, again, a technical legal word that nobody understands called eminent domain, right. coming right. from where? Coming from the Middle Ages in England right that a town has the power to take over property which injures the interests of the people of the town. And they want to take it over, and what are the big corporations doing? They're going into court, and they're charging that what? This is Bolshevism. <laughs> this is un-Americanism. <laughs> we have the right not only to own a plant, to close a plant, period. All right, so the plant, the family farmers are saying, we can't win by ourselves. It's true. The plant closing people can't win by themselves, the working people, the union people. But if we get together, we have a fighting chance. And then what are they saying? We want to get together. And they've asked for meetings now, and this is making American history, meetings with representatives of the black movements all through the South who are facing, as folks all through the South know, homelessness, homelessness poverty, poverty and uh, redistricting, losing the right to vote. Then you take in the urban areas of the north, what's the most serious problems? I don't know whether you have it down here. Drugs. Housing. Housing. Homelessness. And then the drug crisis from one end of the country to the other. So people are getting together. Take the women's movement. Women are furious because what? The same Supreme Court in June came down with a decision which put the knife in to what had been decided in Roe against Wade as the fundamental right of women to make decisions over their own lives, their own bodies, and the right to abortion. And so the women are saying, we've got to do something about this. And not only the right to abortion, the right of women not to have sexual harassment in a job. Right, right. Which I don't have to tell you folks, that's one of the most current phenomena in our society that women have this experience in factories and in employment and everything else. So if you add together all of these groups and they uh, unite to fight for what? All kinds of radical changes, nonsense, to fight for their immediate survival. needs, survival, what will that mean? And the folks in the power structure, the industrial military complex, and that's not a radical term. You know who that was first Dwight used Eisenhower. by? Eisenhower. Eisenhower right. yeah. first used that term, all right? If all of these folks come together and fight for their immediate needs, then the power of the industrial military complex is threatened. And we will have a change. We have a new type of government, a new type of government representing the needs and interests of the people. And the power structure is scared to death about this. Right. And that's why they are saying that what do these people do? They'll use these elementary constitutional rights to organize 
They'll use it to come together. They'll use it to fight for their rights. Therefore, a moment has come when we have to get rid of these rights. And what are they putting forward? And I lived through this in the Nixon period because I was thrown right into this fight in the Supreme Court of the United States. Little concept known as what? The inherent power of the President of the United States to suspend the Constitution or any provisions thereof or any laws of the government when he decides it's in the national interest to do so. And they're putting that forward once again? <laughs> that what happened is that they simply, now that they had the power to implement this on a national scale, they did so. Through, uh, primarily through the Federal Emergency Management Administration with yeah. uh, a series of um, uh, steps that were first rejected, I might add, under Nixon. Some of these theories were first promulgated under Nixon and first promulgated when Reagan first came to office, and Congress rejected the packages of legislation. What has happened, however, is that almost every single element of this repressive apparatus that was first scenarized in uh, California has been passed into law by Congress on a piecemeal basis, so that you have change of authority set up and structures set up and detention camps set up and uh, plans for instead of the National Guard reporting to the governor of the state the National Guard now becomes militarized the establishment of you know these uh, uh, state defense forces which are nothing more than uh, sort of um, armed vandals of our society being empowered to enforce the law what a great idea you know and every and gun nut in America now is part of the strategic you know this uh, state defense force mm -hmm. movement and because, they're being organized. And they're being organized mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and trained. So loonies, the, the craziest people yeah. in the Reagan administration were involved in formulating these plans, and we still don't even know. Well, but, but now, yeah. interestingly enough, yeah. given the way society functions, a lot of these people were moved out. They sort of lost a power struggle for control of this apparatus, uh, in part because some people in government thought they were too lunatic. Right. That's the good news. The bad news is the apparatus remains, and in, it's in somebody's hands, and we don't know who really now is the, the agency or agencies or administrators who are, in fact, in control of this apparatus that has been set up. What's important to know is that the apparatus exists. It still exists today, and therefore we are dependent on the goodwill of who is at the uh, controls of this apparatus. But it's no and longer in FEMA. Gio Frieda was, not forced to resign was forced to in resign in 1985. Over power struggle, over this very issue. But FEMA still exists. Whenever FEMA there's the earthquake exists. or the floods... Well, they don't do a very good job recently. with earthquake and flood. <laughs> you know, right. But you saw them on the news. Yeah. Um, I right. had some of my students do some research into FEMA. So they went through databases. You noticed how their funding works, how much is for natural disaster and how much is for just sort of stuff. Right. It was only a small percentage. Small percentage is for natural was, was disaster. For nat right. So, but is it certain that they no longer have these secret uh, plans? Or it was oh, they still have the plans. There's, no, there's still the structure within FEMA exists, but the people who were running the show, like I see. Frida, have been moved out, and it's not clear whether it's NSC or a bizarre department of the Veterans Administration because of National Guard and Reserve duty, or the, it's not clear if it's in the Pentagon. I mean, it's sort of like they, you know, somebody robbed a bank and took the money, and they caught the bank robbers and, and put them in jail, but no one's going to tell you where the money is. You know, it's like they've dealt with half the problem. They got rid of the people who designed the system, but somebody's still in control of the system, and that's what we have to find out. And uh, people like Dr. Reynolds and, and others are trying to unravel that now, and it's a difficult task because, of course, national security Someone doesn't allow needs you to, to blow the whistle. Someone needs to, to blow the whistle here. Say right. where it's gone and what the plans are. Right. We know they're still there. We just don't know who's running the show. Uh, so. Interesting. Well, there are also a lot of these uh, things could be dealt with through national security directives, which are secret. Uh, secret. Now, what they are setting up is a new bevy of laws, 15 or so, but there's more than 15, uh, national laws, Supreme Court uh, precedents, uh, programs being prepared that will create a new situation in the next war so that the public will not have the full access to the truth of what's happening. Uh, and then so that dissidents can be controlled, so that people can't make their political weight felt by taking to the streets, by demonstrating. Uh, some of these, just to mention a few of them, for example, you have uh, the Marchetti and Snep rulings of the Supreme Court, which gives the government the right to censor books before publication. 
In the SNEP case, they, uh, they didn't accuse him of revealing any secrets. They just claimed that he had an unauthorized...